Hello, my name is Nancy Knowlton and I work at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. And today I'd like to talk to you about climate change and in particular the effect of climate change on coral reefs. Now it's important when thinking about climate change and coral reefs to recognize that climate change is not the only thing that's happening to coral reefs today. There is a coral reef crisis, it's both local and global, and it's caused by a variety of things in addition to climate change. And essentially if you want to think about it uh, as what we're doing to planet Earth or planet ocean as I like to think about it. Uh, we're doing a huge experiment where, where we're putting things into the system and then we're taking things out of the system as well. So on the input side we're putting in nutrients, toxic material, sediments, and invasive species and carbon dioxide which is of course the root cause of climate change and then of course on the output side we're taking out anything big. So climate change has to be viewed for coral reefs as part of a, a, a complex assemblage of, of threats that coral reefs face. Uh, and, and it's important to recognize that and we'll get back to this uh, in terms of its, con its implications for what to do about climate change towards the end of the talk. Now as I said this is a, a global problem that coral reefs are facing and have been facing for quite a while. And Before we get into the nitty-gritty of climate change I'd like to give you a sense of the scale of the threats that coral reefs face. This photograph was taken when I was a student uh, in 1975, quite a long time ago at this point, but at the time the corals looked absolutely beautiful. Uh, ev almost everything you can see in this picture, the heads of coral right here, or all the branching corals all through here, another bushy-like coral down here, all of that was living coral and about 70 percent of the bottom was covered with living coral back in 1975. Unfortunately, those reefs are essentially now gone and they've been replaced by uh, seaweed reefs primarily. And if this were just a story of Jamaica and Discovery Bay, that would be one thing. But it, as I said, it's a global, uh, global problem. And as a consequence, recent estimates suggest that about one third of all reef building corals are now at risk of extinction. And as I mentioned before, and I'd like to emphasize again, this is not just climate change, but a combination of climate change and local impacts such as overfishing and pollution and uh, invasive species in some places. So why does this matter? Why do we actually care about coral reefs uh, in the context of climate change? Well, first of all, they're home to millions of species. How many millions? We don't actually know, but, uh, but millions, large numbers. In fact, their coral reefs are really the most diverse uh, environment uh, that we have in the ocean. And uh, some of them are, are grow on corals, like you saw in the previous slide, and some of them wander around, such as these beautiful crabs that you see uh, in parts of the Pacific Ocean, uh, and make coral reefs their home. Now coral reefs are also very important to us as people economically. Uh, they provide food, they are the source of uh, uh, tur support tourism because people come to coral reefs to uh, snorkel and dive on them. The biodiversity itself is important in the context of biopharmaceuticals and other products and the reefs themselves provide protection to shorelines against big waves from storms or even earthquakes as, uh, as in the context of tsunamis. Now it's interesting to note that um, this value of uh, coral reefs often is uh, one in which the, the actually just having a healthy reef there is the biggest part of the value. The non-extractive uses often dominate uh, the value of coral reefs. And globally, the numbers we're talking about are big. $29.8 billion is one of a recent estimate of how much coral reefs are worth to people around the world every single year. So global warming is a, is a consequence of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And the reason coral reef biologists care about global warming is because of the relationship between global warming and something that's called coral bleaching. Now you see here a picture that uh, was taken in Panama in uh, September of 2010. And you can see that all the corals, practically everything you see there is bone white. That is, they're bleached. And uh, this is what people mean by coral bleaching. And uh, 2010 in the Caribbean was a particular severe example, but we've had a number of severe examples of coral bleaching over the last couple of decades. Now the reason people care about coral bleaching, uh, coral reef biologists in particular care, but the public at large uh, sh does care as well, is because the corals uh, often die if the bleaching is severe. And this is a picture uh, taken of the Great Barrier Reef during a major bleaching event. And most of the corals you see here, these big white corals 
which you see scattered all the way out to the distance. All of these are bleached, and a number of the brownish ones in here are actually dead. And during the 1998 El Nino in the Indian Ocean, for example, about 80% of the corals bleached, and about 20% of them died. So we're talking about major, major sources of mortality. And in this context, it's also very important to remember that corals grow slowly. They grow rather like trees, only about a half an inch a year. So that means it takes a long, long time for reefs to recover after one of these major bleaching events. Now, what is bleaching? It's essentially a breakdown in the symbiosis, the positive relationship between the coral animal and tiny one-celled algae that live in its tissues. And here you see on the top, um, a picture of a coral. This is one coral here. Uh, it's actually a, a somewhat unusual coral in the sense that it's a single uh, coral polyp, as it's called, with a mouth in the center. And what you can see here is the skeleton, which is white, in the center, and then this filmy circle around that white skeleton is actually the living tissue of the coral. So the coral in this picture is still alive. But because the, there's been a breakdown in the relationship between the corals and their symbiotic algae, you can actually see right through the tissues. It's as if we as people, suddenly our muscles all became transparent. And you could look right through our, our, our skin and our muscles and could see our skeletons walking around. That's what you've got going on here. And here's another example a little bit farther away. And you can see a mixture of healthy or reasonably healthy coral parts of the coral colony, which have a normal coloration, and then these white parts, which are still alive, but you're seeing right through the tissue into the skeleton, which is why it looks bleached. Now, the biggest problem with respect to climate change and bleaching is that corals are very, very sensitive to even relatively small increases in temperature. So here you see the temperature record from about, uh, uh, about the year 1000 into the present and then projected into the future based on computer models. Now the biggest problem is that bleaching tends to occur when temperatures are about one degree centigrade above the normal seasonal maximum. So here you see this dotted line, which is the, what you can think of as the bleaching threshold where bleaching occurs. And what you can see very clearly here, and which is the reason coral reef biologists are so worried about uh, global climate change, is that the projections for the future relatively quickly by the middle of this century have temperatures way above the bleaching threshold, suggesting that bleaching and massive mortality of corals could become a regular event, uh, say by 2050. Now there's also secondary effects that are associated with bleaching because bleaching, even if the coral doesn't die right away, it's a very stressful uh, a stressful condition. And often what happens is that corals might survive the bleaching per se, but then they succumb to various kinds of disease. So you see two kinds of disease here, white band disease affecting this coral here, and then black band disease. Here you see the coral that's uh, dead, and then this advancing front of black band disease moving down and killing the coral progressively. And these kinds of diseases become much more common after uh, corals on a reef have bleached. And now, unfortunately, warming oceans are not the only problem with respect to climate change. And that's because the same carbon dioxide that's causing global warming is also dissolving into the ocean and making the ocean more acidic. And this is called ocean acidification. Sometimes we call it the other CO2 problem or global warming's evil twin. And this is, in the long term, perhaps as serious or even more serious than the, the effects of rising temperatures on coral. So here you see a chart which shows this, essentially the suitability of ocean chemistry for coral reef growth. And back in the 1700s, these red areas, those are all areas where coral reef uh, are expected, corals are expected to grow easily. Uh, and then as you move towards the, through the present and into the future, you arrive at a world where uh, conditions for coral reef growth are, are very poor throughout much of the tropics where corals uh, grow. And so the projections for the future uh, in terms of the relationship between ocean acidification and coral reefs are arguably even more serious than they are for global warming. Now why is this? It's essentially because when corals grow in acidic water, they find it much, much harder to grow their skeletons. And so here you see uh, an experiment that was done. Uh, this is a healthy coral, and then it was put in water, uh, acidic water, like what we might see by the end of the century. And you can see that the, all these coral, the, the entire colony has lost its skeleton. And so these individual 
uh, components of the coral colony, the polyps, have com completely dissolved away their skeleton and they're growing as individual sea anemone-like structures. And actually, scientists were somewhat surprised by this result in the sense that the corals themselves did, the, the coral did survive, it didn't die outright. But the, the problem here is that these things uh, have no skeleton, they can't build reefs. You can't have a great barrier reef made of soft, squishy things like sea anemones. And so with ocean acidification, we're likely to lose that three-dimensional complexity, which makes it possible for reefs to be the home for these millions of species that I mentioned at the beginning. Now, initially, when these photographs were published in a scientific paper, they were called scenarios for the future. But since that paper was published, we've actually found places in the world which naturally mimic what we might be heading to globally in these small places where carbon dioxide is actually bubbling out of the seafloor, almost like champagne. And what that causes is a ch local change in the, in the chemistry of the ocean. And so you can essentially have a mini experiment that replicates what we're likely to see, uh, say, by the end of this century. And when you look at these uh, natural carbon dioxide uh, seeps where ocean chemistry has changed through this champagne-like process. What you find is away from the seeps, the reefs look like healthy, normal reefs. But as you get closer and closer to those champagne bubbles, then you move first into a world where many of the corals that, particularly the branching, the more delicate corals like those shown here, uh, drop off and all you find are these big massive corals in place. And eventually, really close to the seeps, in places where, uh, say, a would be equivalent to about a thousand parts per million um, uh, in terms of uh, concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you lose coral reefs altogether. So we know both from experiments in the lab and actually observations in the real world where we've got many examples of extreme ocean acidification that coral reefs and high concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are really, they just don't go together. And, and in this context, it's important to remember that when the carbon dioxide that we're, we are releasing today stays in the atmosphere for a very long time, centuries, because it takes a long time for it to sort of cycle out of the atmosphere. And as a consequence, everything we're doing today, has a, it, the effects have a very long lag, and it takes a long time for the, the atmosphere to repair itself in the context of carbon dioxide. So these are, it, it's very, the sooner we do something about the carbon dioxide problem, the better. Now, what can we do now? Uh, now Obviously, in the long term, we have to deal with a carbon dioxide problem. But in the short term, it's important to remember what I started off with, which is that the coral reef crisis that we're facing is both a local problem and a global problem. And so you've got a lot of things in addition to carbon dioxide. You have carbon dioxide here, but you have all these other things that are going on, uh, taking the nutrients in the water, for example, or the overfishing, taking every, anything big out of the ocean. Now, those are something that we can do about now. Uh, and why is that problem? Because anything that we can do to redu reduce, reduce local stresses helps uh, make coral reefs more resilient. That is, if you have an extreme bleaching event and a lot of coral mortality, the, the corals that survive are better able to bounce back and, re and regrow into a healthy reef if locally the conditions are uh, favorable for coral growth. And so in terms of the, what we can do now, there's actually a lot we can do now on the short term and the local scale. And it basically boils down to two primary things we need to do. We need to control fishing pressure so that coral reefs uh, don't get covered with seaweeds. Uh, what happens is when you have a lot of, when you take fish out of the system, you take a lot of the seaweed eating fish out of the system and then the corals tend to be smothered by the by seaweeds, and then you can improve water quality, which uh, bad water quality both kills corals directly and also, again, favors the growth of seaweeds. Now, this isn't actually rocket science. We know how to do this. This is pretty easy to do in the science sense of things. And uh, we know how to do it, as, and one of the most important ways uh, that we can do this is uh, through the uh, placement of marine protected areas. Uh, these essentially create more resilient reefs by reducing local stressors. And in Australia, we have kind of a gold standard, if you will, for uh, uh, protection on the Great Barrier Reef, where more than 33% of the entire area of the Great Barrier Reef is in no-take uh, status. That means that you're not allowed to take any fish out at all. And so this is a kind of gold stat standard for which we would hope to uh, aim uh, around reefs around the world. And the United States, we also have four mega protected areas that occur in U.S. waters, both in the northwest 
Hawaiian Islands shown here and also in a couple of other places through the Pacific, including the Northern Line Islands here. So we, we've set up uh, protected areas to produce more resilient reefs in some places, but a lot more needs to be done. And then some things aren't actually uh, directly uh, improved by marine protected areas alone, for example, water quality, which typically involves uh, managing how we use the land because things in the land ultimately wash into the ocean. So to conclude, um, we ha there are things we can do. We want to re reverse this trajectory of reefs going uh, cascading downward. We want to get to the point where reefs are starting to recover. So in the short term, in the local scale, control fishing and improve water quality. But we are going to have to do something on the longer term and global scale, which is harder to do. This is rocket science. We're going to have to figure out how to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and move to a, an economy which is less carbon intensive. And then in that kind of intervening period, we're also going to have to work very hard to prevent extinctions while we, while we learn to transition to a lower carbon kind of economy. And this actually, this part really is rocket science. Thanks very much.